Okay, afternoon everyone and welcome to this Layers of London webinar. Um, I'm really pleased to have Michael Marshall from MOLA join us today. Michael's the Senior Fine Specialist in the organisation and he'll be taking us back to Londinium and sharing what I hope will be lots of fantastic uh, Roman artefacts with us today and, uh, and explain a bit more about how those artefacts can reveal the material culture of life in Roman London. If Michael's ready, I think I'll pass over to him and we can get started. Okay, hello everyone. Um, uh, my name is Michael Marshall. Um, I am one of the team of fine specialists who work for MOLA. Um, MOLA is one of the largest archaeological units in Britain uh, and uh, we've been involved for decades in doing lots of uh, research in and around London. So we've got uh, uh, a lot of knowledge about um, London's landscape uh, and so I guess it makes sense that some of us are being involved um, with uh, this Layers of London uh, seminar series. Uh, let's just... Uh, excellent, right. Um, slightly oddly, um, given the fact that Layers of London is focusing largely on sort of um, spatial information, uh, and maps and things like that. My particular area of expertise is small things, um, little bits of material culture, what we quite often call small finds, which are pe part of people's everyday life, really, from the past. Um, but just like how uh, Les of London is able to capture some more ephemeral things um, within its collections and plot them within a spatial context to make more sense of them, um, we can do the same thing with archaeological finds. And that's really what I'm going to attempt to do today. So while my title is Material Culture in Roman London, the emphasis is really going to be on the in, um, hence why it's in bold here. Right, yes. Okay, so Unfortunately, we lack maps for Roman London. Um, we've got no real good um, uh, equivalent, something like the Agus map, um, uh, which we have for the post-medieval period. Um, in fact, in terms of pictures of Roman London and uh, contemporary visual um, representations, we're very, very limited indeed. Um, here's an example of the sort of traces that we actually do have, uh, which, uh, as you can see, this is um, the Arras medallion, which was, uh, minted to commemorate the liberation of the city in the late third century, London itself is really just um, a prop here. It's to show how fancy Constantius I is. You can just see it hiding behind a, a, a very kind of grateful Londoner. You see a little bit of its city walls. Um, the purpose of this object is not uh, to give us um, a real sense of the city as a place. Um, we do have some contemporary historical records which give us some sense of the city as a place. We know its name uh, from uh, historical accounts of writers like Tacitus, um, and now uh, also from inscriptions uh, and writing tablets and other material that have been recovered uh, by archaeologists. So here's some very nice uh, recent finds, uh, some of the Bloomberg writing tablets excavated by Mola and translated here by uh, Roger Tomlin. So we have things like the addresses on the back of this tablet that says to Megontius at Londinium. So this is the very earliest mention of our city's name. Um, and also these, these texts can give us some idea of the sort of spatial framework and some of the places that existed within the city. So for example, I'm fascinated by the fact that this text is um, addressed to Junius the Cooper opposite the house of Catullus. So just telling, um, the person to, who was meant to deliver this, the profession of the person, their name, and perhaps their, their spatial relationship to a more famous person, perhaps. Um, uh, Catullus was enough to get it there. It doesn't really work like that with the postal system today. Um, and we get um, just little snippets of things happening in places within the city. So this on the, uh, the right of the slide, you can see that somebody is talking about boastful behavior in the market and ill-advised uh, lending of money. Now we might assume that the market is the forum, the large market in the centre of town, uh, of a Roman town, and that's possible but we don't really know, we don't really know where this market was. 
Uh, in fact, there are some places that are quite well attested in inscriptions that we just don't know where they were in space. So that's things like uh, the Temple of Isis, um, which is known from a uh, flagon uh, found in Southwark, which says uh, London at the Temple of Isis. Some people have suggested it might be from a pub next door. Um, or this altar, which, was, um, which commemorates the restoration of the temple after it had fallen down. So we have a sort of um, a sense not only of place, but also of history here you know, as places that are involved in events. Uh, and then finally, this is a little bit less anchored into spatial places, but this is um, a wonderful inscription that came from Tabard Square in uh, Southwark, uh, excavated by PCA. And uh, it's the earliest mention of Londoners. Um, so it's, you know, the idea that people uh, get some of their identity from London as a place itself. Uh, one of the things that really fascinates me about this inscription um, is that the person who dedicated it um, described, also describes himself as a citizen of the Belovaki. The Belovaki uh, are actually a tribe from northern France. So the first person who professes to be a Londoner um, is actually um, from a completely different part of Europe. Um, uh, uh, and that's uh, just a, a reflection of the very, very cosmopolitan nature of Roman London, uh, a city which was indeed probably founded uh, by immigrant community coming from uh, northern France and Germany. So now we might want to, to move beyond these sorts of snippets and think of London more kind of cohesively um, as a place that we can really wrap our head around. And this is about as close as we can get um, to uh, a map of Roman London, um, to that sort of bird's eye view uh, that we all um, have been able to enjoy for lots of different periods in layers of London. Uh, so this is a wonderful reconstruction drawing done by Peter Frost for the Museum of London. And this shows the city um, from the Northwest. And it's based on lots and lots of archeological information. Uh, it's a very sort of drawn out view though. It can't capture a lot of the sort of interesting social information that some maps can. So thinking, thinking again in terms of things that are on layers of London, things like the Charles Booth poverty map. This, is, this doesn't really show people, it just shows um, sort of urban fabric. Um, now even this is actually a very difficult thing to reconstruct because uh, London today, um, looking at about the same view, looks like this. Londinium uh, is buried underneath 2,000 years of history and if we want to find it we have to go looking for it. Um, as archaeologists that normally means uh, excavations that take place ahead of development. Uh, now one of the um, difficulties uh, with that um, is that uh, when we're trying to present Roman London to the public, and when we're trying to allow people to, to make a direct connection to it, um, that material, uh, those streets and houses that are buried far beneath the city, um, it's quite hard to bring them back um, to the surface. Um, in a few places um, like uh, the London Mithraeum or the Amphitheatre or the Billings Bay, a bathhouse, we can go and visit them. We can go under the ground and go and see the buildings in their original uh, position. But it's a lot easier for us to bring objects back from Roman London. And this has been a big part of how people have materialized Roman London um, uh, really for centuries. So on the left of my slide here, you can see Charles Roach Smith's uh, Museum of London Antiquities, where he thought it was very important for the public to be able to see um, uh, parts of their past materialized um, and he built up this great collection which he made available to people um, uh, in the city uh, and this includes uh, Roman objects and prehistoric objects and medieval objects and this sort of process still goes on today uh, you can see this um, this huge wall covered in Roman material culture that's part of the um, uh, the Bloomberg space uh, which uh, is uh, above the site of the London Mithraeum now, whilst that sort of ex situ, you know, out of place view of objects is a nice way to, to think about and to connect with Roman London, it's not necessarily the best way to, um, to start understanding it in more detail, especially in a spatial context. Now we're lucky that there are some bits of the Roman city that are still in situ. Um, the London Wall in particular is an important, um, uh, I guess, um, an anchoring point for our understanding of the ancient city. You can still see it today. Um, it was built probably around the end of the second century 
um, and was reused throughout the medieval and later period. So you can see on this slide on the left, the lower courses with the tiles and the ragstone uh, is the Roman wall and uh, above that where it's uh, just stone um, is the later wall. So that's a part of the Roman city we can really kind of come to terms with and confront in our everyday lives. Um, but this material that we find through excavations, um, we also can try and put it back within that spatial context. And again, this has been going on for a long time. Um, so antiquaries uh, used to get reports of finds on building sites, for example, um, especially things like this, complete pots um, often associated um, with graves. And they did some quite remarkable work really, um, trying to reconstruct Roman London from these fairly slight traces. Uh, so these are some old um, uh, maps put together um, by Mortimer Wheeler, but using uh, earlier antiquarian observations. And you can see here that they've plotted the line of the city wall in red, that's that thin red line that runs around the city of London. And then they've plotted on, in to, on the left-hand side of the slide, they plotted the site of Roman burials, represented by human remains and those sorts of complete Roman pots. And they figured out that there were burials which went outside the wall. Um, and we know that Romans uh, had their cemeteries outside their towns, but also some, some burials within the wall, which told them that there must have been a period of time when the town was smaller, um, because um, the assumption would, was that the burials wouldn't be in amongst where people were living. Um, and as we shall see, that's um, an absolutely correct contention. Um, approaching the same sort of question from material that might relate more to people's uh, lives, you know, on an everyday basis. Um, here's a plot of early Roman pottery uh, from the city. And you can see it concentrates very much within the wall and particularly more sort of towards the eastern half of things. There's that big sort of cluster. And that is uh, exactly where we know the earliest part of the town was. There's also a little smatter over in Southwark. So we know there was a Roman settlement over there as well. So from that, you can infer quite a lot about uh, town. You know, there's a walled area, possibly with a court or um, to the east. Um, there's something on the other side of the river as well. And we know this is a good crossing point. Um, and there are cemeteries um, around about the town. So that's what you can do with antiquarian information. Luckily, um, increasingly over the course of the 20th century, uh, we started um, recording London's archaeology in quite a lot more detail. Uh, so MOLA and other archaeological units will go in uh, ahead of development, we will record buildings uh, and we combine all that information together uh, in order to get a much better picture of the whole city. So on the top right hand um, part of my slide you can see all those green dots are all separate archaeological interventions in and around the city of London and by combining those um, by combining the individually excavated buildings captured um, with those red plans you can see at the bottom right, uh, we can start to get an idea about things like urban density, layout, we can identify um, major public buildings um, and add a lot of detail really uh, to that uh, city plan. The other part of that of course is we found lots and lo find lots and lots of Roman material culture. So that's literally thousands and thousands of boxes of finds and they come from known contexts. So here's a shot of the Museum of London Archaeological Archive um, with what I think is Lairs of London's Adam Corsini in a previous life um, uh, there in the background. And the great thing about this material um, is that we can link it to individual archaeological features, individual layers. Um, so that whether that be a pit or the floor of a Roman building and really get quite a high resolution um, picture of Roman London on that basis. So these finds play a lot of different roles within archaeology. One of the most important one is dating. So here is a cross section um, through one of our excavations uh, at the Bloomberg building, uh, showing the different layers that are built up through time and also some of the finds that came from excavating this area. And by thinking about what, where finds of different date came from, we can date these different layers and we can get a sense of how rapidly the archaeology builds up. We can get a sense of uh, when the character of occupation changes, when you get new buildings, when buildings are destroyed, things like that. And when you add all that information together on a really large scale, you can uh, really kind of think about how the landscape developed as a whole. So here is tens of thousands of different um, uh, archaeological contexts from London uh, plotted on a graph by date. Um, and uh, 
from these were all dated using Roman pottery. And we can see that there's this really early peak from the time the city was founded in the uh, late 40s or around AD 50 um, up to into the late first century where there's lots and lots of archaeology forming. Uh, then there's a bit of a dip. Then there's the second peak um, in what we call the Hadrianic and Antonine periods. So that's really the middle of the second century. And in the late Roman period, um, we don't have so many archaeological layers. Uh, so this is quite a powerful way of uh, looking at London's archaeological record. Um, people have suggested that this might um, reflect things like um, changes in population and then that fall um, after the middle of the second century might reflect a change to a lower, less dense um, uh, urban environment. Um, but what it certainly does reflect is activity um, uh, results in the deposition of finds and in the deposition of different archaeological layers. And when you put that in a spatial context, um, you can start thinking about how the city develops as a landscape. So here's some phase maps from a recent paper by Dominic Perring, and you can see how this, the, the early dated features start off on the, uh, to the east of the Warbrook, on the north bank of the Thames, around what turns into the sort of urban core. Um, the city grows uh, in the late first century. We get some of our first major public buildings like the amphitheatre and the Forum. Continues to grow, and this is really that second peak of activity we saw earlier in the middle of the second century. We get a fort, um, a lot of the uh, buildings are monumentalised in stone. Uh, the city wall then goes in around the end of the second century. Growth really has started to decline um, uh, by now. Um, now there's still lots of kind of high status things going on. Uh, the building of a city wall, for example, is a, is a really huge um, investment of uh, labour and effort. Uh, but the city stopped growing and that might be why we're not getting so many uh, layers and finds deposited. Um, and by the late Roman period, um, burials have started to appear within the town again. Um, and it, there's a sense that perhaps activity might again be clustered and uh, urban activity might be focused uh, on that eastern hill uh, around where it says Basilica, um, where there's a rather remarkable uh, late Roman uh, building, which could be a cathedral. So uh, we can use finds to give us that sort of um, spatial context. Uh, we can use finds to date our archaeology and allow us to kind of write histories uh, with it. Uh, we can, uh, and to a certain extent, create these sort of broader geographies of you know, areas that are inside and outside the town and how that develops over time. Uh, but one of the great things about archaeological material is that we sometimes have much, much more specific uh, sense of a finds context. So here's just three little examples. Um, on the left hand side of the slide, uh, this is a Roman building being excavated on Gresham Street. And you can see um, there's at least uh, kind of three or four different uh, rooms as part of that building, one of which has a lovely mosaic floor, it might be quite a kind of a posh building and perhaps a reception or dining uh, room. And through the wall from that in the foreground um, and in the detail photo, there's a lot of pottery that were um, which has been left there because the building burnt down. And that looks like a shelf full of pottery, um, which looks like um, fairly kind of common uh, kitchen wares, flagons and mortaria for uh, mixing up food and things like that. So immediately we've got a sense of how this building works. We've got the fancier room, we've got um, this alternative room, which might be a storeroom or part of the corner of a kitchen um, where stuff actually gets done. Um, then here we have in the top right, we have uh, a kind of a wonderful moment of time, uh, a coin uh, in the mass step of the boat found at Blackfriars. This is a little sort of good luck ritual. Uh, the coin shows the Roman goddess Fortuna on the reverse and it's little offerings to, to Fortuna, to Lady Luck. When you put together your boat, um, you've placed a coin in it as, a, as an offering. Or in the bottom right hand corner, these are some of the sculptures uh, from the Warbrook Mithraeum, which I'll be returning to later. And you can start to see how um, by thinking more carefully about these finds at this sort of smaller scale, um, we can really start to, to capture some moments in time and think about how different spaces were used uh, and uh, sort of very specific episodes in history. So um, uh, here's a, a good example of how we can um, start to think about these environments that the finds circulate in. This is some of the wonderful plaster from Lime Street, um, which uh, my colleague Ian Betts 
um, has studied uh, being excavated carefully um, uh, by conservators on site and reconstructed to give a really good impression of what the interior decoration of this building might have looked like. And you can imagine how combined with information about fine assemblages, uh, like the Gresham Street example, um, we can start to produce these more sort of uh, nuanced and differentiated material reconstructions. So rather than just putting everything on shelves together, we can start to think about different ancient spaces and the different objects that belonged in them. We can do that on a number of different scales. So I've just got a couple of little case studies here uh, showing how that's possible with some very different kinds of social activities. And we look at fashion, which you might think of as a very ephemeral thing, um, uh, but which leaves its own material trace. Um, I'm going to look uh, briefly at sort of domestic and economic activity as represented through pottery. And I'm going to think about um, uh, craft and industrial activity reflected through industrial waste. So in terms of fashion, um, one of the things that we find a lot on Roman sites are brooches. And here are some uh, from the Bloomberg excavations. I've just divided these up here into three categories. Uh, one of which is pre-Roman Iron Age styles, so the styles of brooches that people were wearing before the Roman conquest. Then in the middle, there's some styles that were introduced by uh, immigrant populations and by Roman soldiers and people like that uh, at around the time of the conquest. And then on the right hand side of the slide, um, there are some new styles which developed within Roman Britain um, and are quite characteristic of the area. And if we think about them within the context of our town, um, uh, as I've done here by just combining uh, the brooch assemblages from uh, lots of different sites. You can actually see that different ranges of brooches were worn in different areas. Now these aren't absolute differences because obviously brooches and people are mobile um, and uh, as far as we know there weren't any laws saying that uh, only fashionable people can live in this area um, or unfashionable people in that area. Um, but you can see that the, the, the brooches that were getting thrown away are quite different area to area. So in particular, um, uh, east of Walbrook, most common types are continental Roman styles and Romano-British types in about equal amounts. In the Walbrook Valley, continental Roman styles are, are much by far the most common. Um, and this is an area where we found a lot of militaria recently that might relate to Roman soldiers. And then uh, to the west of the Walbrook um, and in Southwark, these slightly more sort of suburban areas, uh, Romano-British styles um, are most popular. So whether this is because these are the areas away from that sort of urban core where the initial immigrant community, um, which came from areas like France and Germany, where the continental styles are popular, um, are, um, is an interesting question. Uh, and when we sort of um, dip into that even uh, deeper, we can see, for example, that we can link uh, these objects to individual buildings. Uh, now we get two main styles of architecture um, in early Roman London. We get rectilinear architecture, which is a sort of very Roman style, and we get roundhouse architecture, um, which is what people use in the pre-Roman Iron Age. And within my case study areas, uh, it's interesting that this sort of Celtic style brooch um, with kind of swirly Iron Age style decoration came from a roundhouse. Uh, so it's a pre-Roman style, um, which somebody who lives in a pre-Roman style building um, likes to wear. Um, and these uh, continental styles uh, brooches were found associated with Roman style buildings. Uh, other sites allow us to look at uh, this in, I guess, even more detail. This is from recent excavations at Moorgate. And here we can see other types of Roman dress accessory is found within this series of timber buildings. Um, hopefully you can see that these hairpins uh, were found in the um, timber structures on the northern half of the excavation, but not on the southern half of the excavation. So these hairpins are used by Roman women um, to uh, style uh, their hair. Um, and again, that's a, um, a custom that was introduced uh, by the Romans at around the time uh, of the Claudian invasion, uh, though this is rather later in the second century AD. So, so what does that tell us about the difference between these different buildings? Well, perhaps the people on the northern half uh, of the site are more fashionable, perhaps they're higher status, perhaps no women live in the buildings on the southern half of the site. Uh, returning to the same uh, area, but looking at a different class of material, we can see that um, people on the northern half of the site, um, they preferred melon beads and these small glass beads, which are again a very 
both very kind of classic Roman styles, whereas people on the southern half of the site uh, preferred glass annular beads, including some where, again, we can see a lot of continuity from Iron Age styles. So actually, are we telling, able to tell something about these people's uh, cultural backgrounds, or at least their preferences um, uh, from the distribution of these different objects? Now we can look at other types of material in a similar way. So for example, we find uh, lots and lots of Roman pottery from London. And that's material that ranges from amphora, which are big transport vessels, uh, as you see on the left-hand side of the slide. They're used to bring olive oil and wine and other things from the Mediterranean up to London. Uh, you see tablewares, like in the bottom middle, uh, which are used for dining. Um, and we see lots and lots of different sorts of coursewares, um, which can include things for cooking. This pottery looks a little bit like the stuff we saw in the Gresham Street house, um, uh, but also includes uh, things like um, containers. Uh, and if we do some statistical analysis of where we find these different types of pottery, uh, we can see that they're not evenly distributed across the city. Uh, so you don't have to understand exactly how the statistics here are working. This is a correspondence analysis plot. Basically, um, the further away from the center of, of the diagram you get, the more distinctive your assemblage is. And the red and orange sites that are kind of trending towards the left and top, which is where amphora is concentrated, are from the eastern part of town around the Forum. The green sites, um, which are from the Warbrook Valley, um, uh, are characterized by having more drinking activity um, uh, and more tablewares. And then there's those, the blue sites, uh, which are slightly um, uh, characterized by having some more uh, kitchen and storage vessels. And that's mostly jars, um, which are, again, a, a big part of Iron Age uh, traditions um, in pottery. So we can perhaps see different consum consumer groups or perhaps different types of activity in different areas of town. I mean, the concentration of amphora around the forum uh, is likely to uh, relate to commercial activity. And this is a lovely um, case study, uh, thinking about how we can think about the spatial focus of craft activity. This is research um, uh, done by Angela Wardle uh, and John Shepherd. Uh, and what they've done here is they've plotted uh, glass working sites by date. Uh, and hopefully you can see that um, the different colors cluster. Um, and what they were able to map was an ongoing process whereby um, over time, glassworking moved from being quite, a, uh, quite near the center of town. So those are the kind of green and light blue dots south of the forum being progressively pushed out further and further as the city grew, um, perhaps as uh, glass workers went away and came back as rents increased. Um, I mean, perhaps we have Roman gentrification going on here. So I'm just going to end um, uh, with a little bit of a case study uh, focusing on uh, some of the finds associated with one of London's most famous buildings, which is the London Mithraeum. Uh, this was excavated in the 1950s originally, um, but we've returned more recently um, uh, doing excavations for Bloomberg ahead of their new building. And you can see a 1950s plan here on the left uh, and also a new reconstruction drawing uh, by Judith Doby, which shows some of what we found in the temple's landscape. So how can the finds add to our understanding of this building and this landscape? Well, first, I think um, it's probably worth saying that even though the temple was formally found in the 1950s, um, the most iconic object from the temple, this image of the Roman god Mithras slaying a bull, was actually found on the same site in the 19th century. Um, so we could perhaps have predicted that there was Mithraeum there beforehand. Um, but in terms of our understanding of this place as a historical landscape, uh, rather than our developing archaeological knowledge, um, we can look at the material that we found in the recent excavations and see if that allows us to tell uh, different sorts of histories about the site. So one of the really interesting things about the material culture that we recovered at Bloomberg is that we find lots of religious and ritual material culture that predates the temple. The temple that was found by W.F. Grimes was built in the third century, uh, but we have lots of objects of religious significance from before that time. Uh, so we have things like this little household shrine um, uh, at the top left made out of pipe clay where your little gods would live, 
um, cult pottery. This one here is the um, the lower half of a naked uh, woman, possibly um, a mother goddess, um, or possibly a stylized representation of Venus uh, on it. And these sorts of um, figural pottery is quite characteristic of what we find at Roman temples. So there may well have been temples and shrines that predated the Mithraeum. And the slide uh, on the right hand uh, part of the slide, we have uh, lots of little votive objects. These are uh, models or small offerings, quite cheap things normally, um, uh, which are given as gifts to the god. Uh, on the right hand side, top right, we can see a little depiction of Mercury, the Roman god of money and trade. So clearly um, Mithras wasn't the only god being worshipped in this landscape if we've got Venus and Mercury around here as well. We've also got some evidence that the Mithraeum itself um, may have uh, existed before the third century. Some of the finds uh, in the area include these uh, little plaques that look like part of the zodiac. And I've matched them up here with the equivalent zodiac symbols uh, on the zodiac frieze that runs round um, uh, the image of Mithras slaying the bull. Zodiac symbolism is quite a big part of Mithraism. We don't have many other zodiac finds uh, from Roman Britain and certainly not from Roman London. So it seems like a very odd coincidence that we found them on the same site. So that suggests to me that there is an earlier Mithraeum uh, which hasn't yet been discovered in the immediate vicinity. So thinking about the third century Mithraeum itself, um, the finds give us new perspectives on what the people who worshiped there believed and what they did with their time. So first of all, it's really interesting that the sculptures that Grimes found uh, obviously includes depictions of Mithras himself, um, but also of other deities. They really emphasize that uh, Roman uh, religion is polytheistic. They believed in many gods um, and they weren't exclusive, um, uh, or at least not at this, at this date in which gods uh, you could believe in. And we can get a sense of what was going on inside the temple as well. So here's some of the finds that are in the Museum of London, uh, discovered by Grimes. They include things like this wonderful silver strainer, which probably is used to prepare wine or other drinks by dipping herbs and spices um, in it. We get some of this very cheap, very plain pottery, which was found in absolutely huge quantities, like a big, uh, massive dump outside the temple. Now, I like to think of it as a sort of disposable cutlery, really, um, from feasting events. Um, so, you know, we've got lots and lots of people coming together and using pots in one go and then throwing them all out. Uh, there was also environmental remains like um, lots and lots of chicken, sort of finger food found there that reflects feasting going on. Um, and we know that Mithras was a god of light and we found lots of lighting equipment um, as well. There wouldn't have been any windows, so it would have been quite a, a dark environment. Um, and light may well have played a, quite an important part in the ritual activities of the cult. Uh, we think that um, uh, there may have been some quite important refurbishments of the temple over time. Sculptures themselves were deliberately buried um, here underneath uh, the, uh, the, the ground within the temple, which some have suggested means that um, the, the god that the temple was dedicated to may have been changed, um, but not necessarily. They could have perhaps just refurbished the place and they wanted to deal with the, um, the statues um, by... Uh, by burying them in the ground on the site rather than uh, completely destroying them. And we also have new insights about the temple's end. We excavated this well, uh, which is just outside the temple. And as you can see, we excavated it under much less pleasant uh, re uh, circumstances than in the reconstruction drawing. But in it, we found um, lots of objects that may well be associated with the temple. Uh, we found um, part of uh, the temple's actual building material possibly, um, uh, inside it, which might suggest that the temple was destroyed about the same time as the well was backfilled. We found a hoard of pewter vessels, which may have came from within. We found part of a decorated lead tank, uh, and we found uh, which had been ritually destroyed, and we found this very fancy piece of belt. So we've got what would looks to me very much like people deliberately and carefully getting rid of stuff at the end of the temple's life. Um, so decommissioning the temple and uh, ritually treating um, uh, objects from within. So hopefully I've persuaded you that we can use archaeological objects uh, to tell um, more interesting stories about uh, London's, uh, Roman London's uh, individual places. Hopefully I've also 
persuaded you that context uh, and spatial information can play quite a big part in helping us tell those stories. And I think I'll wrap up there. Marvellous. I'm just going to put my video. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, that was absolutely fascinating. And I really love the way you can bring out the actual Londoners in Londinium. So, um, so amazingly, with sort of tiny objects in many cases. Um, it, it was a really fantastic talk and especially the way you linked it all back into the distribution maps. And I'm sure there's going to be loads of questions. So if, if any attendees do have a question, please do feel free to put it into the, the Q and A's or the chat and um, we'll go through them. Um, I might start with a question for you actually. Um, and that's, do you ever, I know a lot of the objects that came up through the Walbrook excavations were one of a kind and the first to appear in London. Um, sure. What do you do when you when you find those things, and how does that how does how do those objects change your interpretations? Um, well, it's it's normally very exciting when we find those those sorts of things. Um, I mean, there there have definitely been um, uh, examples of objects which have really quite fundamentally changed the way we thought about Roman London's history. So, a good example from the Bloomberg excavation would be um, one of the writing tablets is dated to AD 62. Now for those who know anything about London's early history knows that the whole city was burnt down in AD 60 or 61 uh, by Queen Boudicca. Um, but, but in AD 62 we've got this amazing document talking about you know, sending um, carts loaded sort of provisions backwards and forwards between London and St Albans. Uh, so we know a rapid, how rapidly the city sort of up and going again uh, just from that one object. I mean, those writing tablets are mind blown in their own right. Um, and um, I'm just looking at the, the chat now. I don't think anyone has any questions, but if, if anyone does have any questions, please do put them into the, the chat because um, we've still got a few minutes. Uh, oh, there's one on the Q&A now. Let's just have a look. Okay. So a question from Claudia, which period are the beads and the buildings at Moorgate relating to? And did the archeologists notice a continuity in these findings through the decades and centuries on the same site? Um, so those beads uh, and hairpins are all dating to the second century activity um, on that site. Um, I think we, we've got quite good activity on that site running into the fourth century. I don't think the findings are, the distinction between those two properties to the north and south are as clear the whole time. So what we're capturing, I think, are quite ephemeral differences. I mean, these might be, you know, two people's different um, personal uh you know senses of fashion it could be as simple as, as as subtle as that um so whilst um uh if you have the same families occupying a property for you know generations you might expect to see longer lived differences um uh you know it what we've been able to get out there is quite subtle um and so we wouldn't necessarily expect it to last beyond um an individual's life great um, there's a question about uh, the artifacts and their connection to layers of London. Have the artifacts that you've shown been plotted on a layer of layers of London? Um, uh, no, um, but actually um, we're really keen to uh, kind of develop these sorts of spatial sides of things um, further and do more sort of big thinking about how small artifacts relate to, to the city as a landscape. Um, and so a lot of the research we're doing at the moment is doing that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, I, I think you're still accepting layers, right? So, we are, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so you never know. Um, I mean, there, there are great archaeological set, uh, data sets on layers of London. There's things like uh, links to lots of London archaeologist articles um, and to HER data. Um, there's things like the, uh, the MOLA um, Greater London uh, publication data sets are up there. Um, so, yeah, it might be possible to get more up. I can keep my fingers crossed for that one. So it's a, um, there's another uh, comment here, and that's, are MOLA planning to run any small fine courses for armchair enthusiasts? Yeah, well, um, this is something that we do do. Um, and, um, and, but unfortunately at the moment, um, given the context of COVID-19, it's quite difficult uh, to get people into the building. Uh, over the last couple of years, we have run um, a, a series of courses um, uh, called MAST, uh, the Molar Academy for Archaeological Specialist Training, 
um, where we've uh, brought people in and provide courses, training them uh, how to identify material culture um, and to, to help research and write up the past. Um, and, uh, you know, our colleagues at the Museum of London um, get volunteers involved um, a lot of the time. So there are opportunities to do these sorts of things. But at the moment, um, the opportunities are quite limited, I'm afraid. Um, I have another question about the comparison between the research you've done in London and other Roman cities throughout the UK. Does the development of the cities follow the same uh, sort of um, phase in? from well, growing and expanding yeah. in the same way? There are a lot of similarities, but then they're, they're not all identical. Um, they've all got their own character, um, which reflect you know, the, the specifics of their local economies and when they were founded and things like that. Um, I think London's really quite exceptional um, in the context of Roman cities in Britain. Um, it's significantly larger um, than the others. Uh, it, it has a lot of the others either grow out of Iron Age centres or grow up around Roman forts. In London, um, it seems to, um, kind of most likely, although there may, may be an early military activity, um, that it was probably a largely trading community that, that uh, founded the city. So it's got its own sort of quite distinct trajectory. Um, lots of official investment because it seems to have become something like a capital um, for, for Roman Britain. Uh, so. so there, there are lots of similarities, but none of them are quite the same. Marvellous. Well, um, we might leave it there because it's coming up to quarter to five. Um, but I just want to say a huge thank you, Michael. That was um, a really fascinating webinar. And, uh, and also a personal thank you for having a cheeky little photograph of me in there as well. So um, no worries. thanks for that. And, uh, and thank you to everybody who attended this. Um, just to say that it has been recorded and will be appearing on our YouTube channel um, next week sometime so um thank you once again michael and yeah, no uh, worries thanks for best. having me bye bye